out of this silence. We'll talk about the story of Jesus, the Christmas story, and really what that means for all of us. And so when we think about that, you know, it's, 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 it's an amazing thing, you know, thinking about Jesus and thinking about Jesus as my inspiration. So I want you to stand as we read our first scripture. We'll look at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, we'll read verses 6 and 7. We'll put that on the screen for you. It reads, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your anointing. We thank you for your grace, for your wisdom, Lord God, that you can use me, Lord, to speak to your people. Uh, we declare that our hearts and minds are open, ready to receive from you as we dig into Jesus as our inspiration. Reveal this truth in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So as I was reflecting on this message and kind of thinking about, you know, all the things that I could, could point to to really bring this point home, you know, I kind of was talking through this and I thought about, you know, the time when I, Byron Williams, who now I'm a um, pub professor at Hub professor, hub pastor at Greenhouse, but previously I was a professor at the University of Florida, an associate professor in computer science. But even prior to that, I was at Mississippi State University as an associate and assistant professor. But even prior to that, I was a PhD student, a master's student, an undergraduate student. And my freshman year, I walked on to play football at Mississippi State University. For those of you that keep up with the SEC, you know that Mississippi State is not a powerhouse, right? We're not like the wonderful Florida Gators, you know, the championships and things that you guys have won and that we've won here in uh, Gainesville. But we do have, like every other SEC school, there, there's, there are seasons where the talent level is high, we've got a great quarterback, a great defense, and it's a really special season even for a small program. And so I had the opportunity to walk on many years ago, but at a time where Mississippi State, we had the number two ranked defense we actually went to the SEC championship, the only time that we've ever gone to the SEC championship. We lost to Tennessee, and I believe that year they were the eventual champions that year. So this was way back when, back in 99, 98, 99. Um, and, you know, we had just a really good team. You know, we were picked to probably start starting the season, we were picked to finish last in the SEC. But we ended up coming out of the SEC West and going to the SEC Championship. And so we're feeling great as Mississippi State Bulldogs because we don't get all the opportunities that maybe some of the larger programs for the continued and kind of ongoing successes. This was also a time where Alabama, Auburn, these teams were not that great. And so we did have a chance to shine in the SEC West. The following season, of course, I'm still a walk-on. I'm trying to make the team, and I'm also majoring in computer engineering at the time. It was challenging. But I was excited, and so were so many other people. There were so many people that decided to walk onto the team that year because the second year, we were actually had a higher ranking, lots of expectations placed on the team. A lot of the same talent that took us to the SEC championship the year before um, were, remained on the team and just we were ready to go. But what happened early in the season, we had a loss to a team that we shouldn't have lost to, right? If you're picked to just about win the SEC West with teams like Alabama, Auburn, LSU, and you lose to a team, and I meant to look it up in between breaks, but it was either Liberty or UAB or Louisiana Tech, you know, great schools, I'm sure, great football programs, but at the time, we were not supposed to lose to this school, and we lost, and of course, the rest of the season was down the drain. And so what that, in terms of thinking about this story and, and our message today, you know, what it points me to is that, you know, something that happens to all of us. I mean, we're all in situ we've all been in situations in life where, you know, we have all the skills to pay the bills. We have all the talent. We know what God has called us to do. People are expecting and predicting that you're going to do whatever you're assigned to do and do it well, whether it's a new job, whether you get married and now you have all the skills to, to have a wonderful life with your spouse, whether you have a child for the first time, you're excited about your first child. But what happens is that when challenges begin to arise, when things begin to not go as well as they should, and adversity comes, you know, we often, even though we were so motivated to start, we often end up uninspired. 
right? Even though all the talent, all the gifts, all the callings, all the everything that we need is there, we fail because we don't have the inspiration or the motivation to continue like we did when we first started. Even in the Bible, it talks about, you know, how uh, in Revelations, it talks about, hey, you don't want to lose your first love. And so many of us believers for so many years, uh, walking with God for so many years. But at the same time, if we think about how we lived when we first met Jesus, how we were so excited about all the things that he was doing in our lives, how he, you know, wrecked us in terms of our salvation experiences, how he um, just impacted us with his Holy Spirit, how he's put us in community. We were just on fire for God. But then years later, you know, we live these mundane lives and this mundane expression of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so what we want to have happen is that just like Jesus, you know, when the Bible talks about Jesus and the things that he accomplished on the earth, in John chapter 21, it talks about how Jesus, even if we were to write down and record all the things that he did, there would not be enough books or we couldn't even, this world contain the number of books to explain all the things that Jesus accomplished while he was on the earth. Right. And so when I think about myself, of course, I know God has called me to do things and you can think about your own self. God has called you. He's called each and every one of us to accomplish certain things on the earth, whether it's be a good husband, be a good wife, uh, to be a good parent, to be a good employee, to be a good business owner, to all the things that we feel like God has called us to do. We often go through this cycle of or this experience in life where maybe we have some ups, we have downs, but then next thing you know, we're just riding in the downs a lot longer, right? There are, there are times where even though, you know, uh, I can be a great husband and I can, you know, uh, have a wonderful wife, she's, she's beautiful, she's smart, she's all the things you'd ever want. But at the same time, you know, it's not just her beauty. It's not just her brilliance. It's not just the beautiful kids that she gave me that's going to keep me, but it's going to be the core, what's on the inside of me, Byron, that's going to make me to be a consistently good husband, to be a consistent good father, to be a consistent good friend, employee, hub, pastor, micro church leader, all the things that God has called me to do. I have to find peace and, um, and, and a way to make sure that those things each and every day I'm consistently excellent and going after God and fulfilling his plan and his vision for my life. Amen. Even uh, John the Baptist. So we're talking about the Christmas story. And one example is, of course, I was reading through Luke uh, chapter one and chapter two, uh, just thinking about Jesus and how he was born. Of course, before Jesus, there was John the Baptist. John the Baptist in in Luke chapter one, the angel came and visited Zechariah. He visits Zechariah. He says, you're going to have a son. Your son is going to be the one, uh, he's going to have the spirit of Elijah upon him. It talks about how great, he's going to be great in the eyes of God. Even John the Baptist, he knew about this, for, uh, about himself, even when he baptized Jesus and people that talked about him and what he would say, even before uh, Jesus came on the scene, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm preparing the way of the Lord. John the Baptist had such a call and purpose on his life, right? He knew it from Uh, being born. His parents, I'm sure they told him all the things that happened to him up to his birth. He was born at the same time, just about the same time that Jesus was. John the Baptist was the man. But at the same time, him being the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, him being the one that's to prepare the way of the Lord, him being the one that baptized Jesus and saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him like a dove, he also had to go to jail. He also had to experience hardship. And in all the hardship that John the Baptist experienced, you know, he even began to doubt the Messiah whom he baptized. You know, he even sent his uh, followers when they visited him at the jail. In Luke, uh, I want to say around verse 7, it says, or chapter 7, it says, he sent them out to ask Jesus, are you the one or should I look for another? Right. So even John the Baptist, with this great call on his life and even how God speaks about John the Baptist, he still had a time of uninspiration. He lived at a, at, at a challenging point in his life where he was uninspired and even doubted the call that he had on his life when angels appeared and all the testimony that he had, you know, growing up. And so my, my case to you this morning is that we can often live uninspired lives. We can live uninspired lives as Christians, as followers of Jesus, walking through life, doing the same old, same old, having a mundane existence. Even, even, even sometimes you see Christians that are, that, are, that are mean-spirited at times. You know, as we were uh, going through this in our microchurch, we said, um, you know, what does it mean to, for Jesus to be your inspiration? And we talked, 
you know, we'll talk about some, some points here. But uh, one thing that came up, somebody said, you know, it's, it's even more than somebody saying, I'm inspired by Jesus. You know, I have a friend of a different religious background. She's inspired by Jesus. And that's good because Jesus did a lot of great things on the earth. He was humble. He turned the other cheek. He, um, you know, a lot of things that he did in terms of just wh- whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you generally would have respect for a person like Jesus. But that's not necessarily what I'm talking about, somebody picking and choosing different characteristics of Jesus to follow. What I'm saying is that Jesus must be our constant motivation. Our inspiration for every single thing that we do in life has to come from not the external circumstances, not even the prophecies that people have made about you, not even the prophecies that they made about Jesus, right? Because even now, another parallel is when we look to the, um, to the children of Israel, around the time when Jesus was born, right? They were thinking, you know, we read Isaiah, you know, uh, he's going to establish a kingdom, wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, of the increase of your government and your kingdom, there shall be no end upon the throne of David to order it and to establish it henceforth from now until forever. Like they're reading the Bible and this is contained in the Bible. And so they see Jesus who's doing all these miracles and they're looking at Jesus, maybe this might be the Messiah, But then they say, well, even though you're doing all these wonderful miracles, when is the kingdom of God going to come? And then in Luke 17, Jesus says, well, the kingdom of God does not come with observations. We won't see it with our eyes, but the kingdom of God is going to be on the inside of you. So even though they expected a a natural kingdom for Jesus to come with horses and with chariots to destroy Caesar and his reign and put them and his people uh, above all others, Jesus said no. Exactly what you expected to happen, even though we have this wonderful prophecy, it's not going to happen the exact way that you expect. But then now what do you do? Do you live an uninspired existence because some word that's prophesied, it doesn't turn out the way that you expected it to turn out? No, you live in such a way that Jesus is your constant inspiration for everything. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. How do I get Jesus to be my inspiration? I want everybody to say, Jesus is my inspiration. Jesus is my inspiration. Amen. So what we're going to look at, since he is the best inspiration, we're going to look at just different principles about how to be inspired by Jesus. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28, it talks about in him we live, we move, and we have our being. That's how we want to live. And so in order to do that, we have to try to live our lives focusing on the works of Jesus, the ways of Jesus, looking at the wonder of Jesus, and the word of Jesus is how we're going to end it up. So let's start with the works of Jesus. The works of Jesus. When we look at the works of Jesus, what we're saying is that we're looking at what Jesus did, what he was able to accomplish while he was on this earth. And so where can we find um, all the things that Jesus did on the earth? Where can we find information about that? In the Bible. That's right. So number one, I have to look at the works of Jesus as, as, as described in the Bible. Somebody name a miracle that Jesus performed. Turn water into wine. What else? Walking on water, absolutely. Um, hit, fish, healing, he raised the dead. He did so many different things. Jesus walked on water, right? Jesus took uh, a couple fish and five loaves and multiplied it and fed more than 5,000 people. Um, he raised the dead, um, uh, walked on water. What else did we say? He, um, he rebuked the wind, right? The storm was coming. And he said, stop. And, and what was the last one? He healed the blind man. Absolutely. Turned water into wine. So, so many different miracles, right? And so now I'm thinking about preparing this message and, and you know, how do I describe the, the works of Jesus in such a way that it's relatable to all of us? So now I guess I need to say, hey, you need to go out and walk on water. We have a Christmas event coming up next week. Uh, Joel said there's going to be flying biscuits. Instead of us ordering 800 biscuits, we're going to order five and allow you to hold them up to heaven, bless them, and multiply them so everybody can have a biscuit Sunday morning, right? Uh, we, we can rebuke the rain and the wind. Last year, we were going to have snow, but it rained, and, you know, you don't want 
snow to turn immediately into ice. And so I'm going to ask you to rebuke the wind and the rain so we can have good weather. Matter of fact, I want it to be cold enough so the snow lasts a very long time uh, with no rain next week. So I want you guys to do that. That's the take home for this message. Be like Jesus. Multiply our flying biscuits. Rebuke the wind next week. Um, I won't turn water into wine unless we're taking communion. But right, or, or, is, or what should I say is, 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 should it be that we look at these things that Jesus did and we begin to glean principles from them, right? Because it's not just for you to turn water into wine, even though when we look at the miracles of Jesus, we can now have faith that God can do the impossible. If he did the impossible when he walked the earth, he can do the impossible now through me. The Bible says, as he is, so am I in this world. And so that's one thing we can gather from that. But the other thing is that, you know, when we look at the type of miracles that Jesus performed, especially when we think about him taking a few fish and five loaves and feeding more than 5,000 people, we can glean from, the, that, from that circumstance that Jesus wants us to consider those that are hungry that are needy, those that are homeless? And how do we as a church begin to serve people that have those types of needs? Again, whether I multiply flying biscuit or whether we order flying biscuits and give them away, the idea or even even a better better, uh, example is our sock ministry. So we have a sock ministry that we support, you know, uh, members of this church that go out every single week and they go to different places, downtown Gainesville, and they serve Uh, a very deserving population with food, right? And so now if I am going to live a life where I am constantly motivated by Jesus, where Jesus is my inspiration, that I need to take all the things that he did and figure out how can I begin to do those things that he has called me to do in my lane, that he has called me to do it. And so now I have to live my life in such a way that I'm giving myself to others, Because until I give myself to others the way Jesus did, my life won't matter, right? I can be so successful in my own right. I could be a business owner. I could be, you know, a professor. I could be a lawyer, a doctor, whatever it is. But at the same time, unless I'm taking and sacrificing myself for others the way Jesus did, my life won't matter. But when I wake up every single day and I have somebody else's problems or needs in mind other than my own, I can get up because I know God is going to supply all my need according to his riches and glory. So I can go out and help someone else and supply their needs. Amen. And so I won't live a life of, of mediocrity. It doesn't matter, you know, how successful I might uh, tend to, to get, but the fact that I can think about somebody else's life, I can sacrifice on my own to live and give to others. Now, I would love to walk on water, One thing I said earlier, I said, if I walked on water, I wouldn't just walk. I would have a nice little strut as I'm walking on water. Like, I would love to be able to, while everybody's swimming, just go to the neighborhood pool and just be walking on the water while everybody's swimming. And I'm saying hi and I wave because Jesus is my inspiration. I can walk on water. Right? I would love that. But we know that that's not necessarily the case unless, you know, it was needed but the idea is that, man, what can I learn from Jesus? In John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it talks about why Jesus was manifested. Like, why did he perform these works on the earth? 1 John 3, verse 8 says that he came to destroy the works of the devil, right? He came to destroy the works of the devil. So if I can position myself in terms of even how I live my life, working my regular job, my nine to five, my business that I own, whatever it is, but I position myself that I do all the things to cover my family and my needs and all those kinds of things, but I am here knowing my purpose is Jesus's purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. I can fulfill and do what God has called me to do and do it with such motivation, such life, and such vigor and energy Amen, that he continues to work and and, and use me. So I have to understand the works of Jesus. Everybody say, Jesus is my motivation. Jesus is my motivation. I have to know the works of Jesus. Number two, I have to think about the ways of Jesus. If the works of Jesus is what he did while he was on the earth, number two, the ways of Jesus is how he did what he did, right? What were his daily routines, what principles did Jesus follow? What did he do? Um, of course, we talk, can talk about all the miracles that he performed, but what was he doing prior to performing those miracles, right? What was his life like outside of the, 
you know, the hustle and bustle of, of once-in-a-lifetime ministry that he, uh, he was able to accomplish. You know, some things that we read about Jesus, you know, even before he went and chose his 12 disciples, he would go up to the mountain to pray. He would spend long nights in prayer, right? Um, we, we read statements in the Bible talking about Jesus as we read through the New, 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 New Testament. It talks about he'd go to the mountain and he prayed as was his custom, right? As was his custom. And so now I can begin to look at the ways of Jesus, right? What were his regular daily routines? One book that I love uh, that talks about this in, in lots of detail, more detail than I'll go into today, is this book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Because one aspect of the ways of Jesus, how he lived his life, was that Jesus was unhurried. He never rushed, right? If you're motivated by Jesus, when I wake up, I'm not asking, you know, what would Jesus do? I'm waking up thinking about, you know, just what's on the inside of me that he's already called me to, and I'm hungry to go out and do those things, right? And so if I'm motivated in such a way, I'm thinking about how do I accomplish this the same way that Jesus did? Matthew chapter 11 Let's take a look at verse 28. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 says, very familiar scripture. It says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right? So if we could just stop there, man, that's great. Because we live in a time with, you know, lots of hustle, lots of bustle, you know, lots of, you know, if you have kids, they're into a lot of things. We have, you know, work. We, you know, of course, we get to come to church. We get to do lots of different things. But he says, first of all, I want you to come to me, all you who labor, so everybody that works, everybody who's heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29 says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so again, not to spend too much time in this section, because this is something that we'll talk about even as we think about our 21-day um, uh, time of consecration in the new year, our 10-day fast that we'll give you some more information about. These are the opportunities where we get to really set time aside, set food aside, things that we desire so that we can intently focus on Jesus. Right? And we do that and we begin to live in these kinds of routines where we're fasting, where we're praying, where we're sacrificing uh, our own physical delight so that we can uh, put ourselves in position to really, really connect and seek God. He's going to move in our lives and use us like never before. Amen. So the works of Jesus, what he did on the earth, the ways of Jesus, how he did what he did. So us taking upon ourselves his yoke, his burden, his ways. The third piece is thinking about the wonder of Jesus. Say the wonder of Jesus. The wonder of Jesus, and I define that as how he's moving in the earth today. How God is moving in the earth today. Because again, Jesus is my motivation. I want to live every single moment motivated, moved by what he wants me to do so that I can accomplish his perfect will in my life. And so in order for me to do that, I need to be in community with people. Right? I need to see how is Jesus moving in the lives of others. If I can see that Jesus is doing certain things in somebody else's life, uh, how they've overcome challenges in their life, the testimonies that they have to share, I can learn from those testimonies. And so my encouragement or admonishment even to all of us is that if we're not in community with like precious believers, you know, uh, we won't be able to say what this shirt says. Because the Bible in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says that they overcome by the, word, the blood of the lamb, right, and the word of their testimony. Where do I get to hear testimony? Of course, when we come together corporately in the big house, you know, there's often times where somebody might come up and share a testimony. You can be in the lobby and hear testimonies of, of all the things that God is doing. There's, there's messages that are going to be shared with the testimonies and the goodness of God. But the other time is when we can come together in our small group settings, our micro churches. I can hear about somebody's salvation story and how God just totally, you know, changed their life and, and totally rewrote their history and the trajectory of their life. And it builds my faith when I hear that, you know, because I know that if they did that, if God did that for this individual, he can do it for me. I can hear stories, even in our micro church, we have stories of, of God canceling over $76,000 in debt 
from one of our members, not because of anything we did, but just knowing that God moved in their life when they prayed and when they had, you know, they, they believed and they had this particular need, $76,000 of debt uh, was canceled. And so if that happens again in somebody else's life, it can happen in my life. Um, we have a couple that's retired, you know, that, but now even retired, now they're working and serving even more, it seems like, in terms of some of their descriptions than they did when they had full-time jobs because now they're serving in one of our under, underserved areas uh, in the communities in Gainesville. And in doing so, they're, they're bringing prayer requests. They're bringing needs from, from people in this particular area that we get to pray for, number one, but then also think about ways we can serve uh, these individuals. Some uh, there was a friend of a friend in our microchurch, they, you know, um, a, a fire. They lost everything in a fire, didn't have renter's insurance. And so what do we do? We put together and we try to serve that individual that's a friend of someone in our microchurch so that we can be a blessing to them. And again, it's not about, you know, our microchurch necessarily, but it's about being in community with other believers, right? I can see how God moves in the lives of others. I know, number one, he can move in my life, but it builds my faith to see God working on the earth. We know he did many great things when he walked the earth. We know that he, um, uh, the way that he did things was just amazing, and we can glean from those things, but I can also look at what he's doing right now and be so amazed at his glory and his goodness that my mind is just always ready to worship and to serve him. There's a song I like, uh, Bethel Music. It's, uh, it's called Wonder is the name of the song. And as I said uh, even earlier, I could sing this song for you, but that would probably be the end of this sermon. So I'm just going to try to read some of the lyrics, and you hopefully can, can get an idea, or maybe, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, you download it later. It says, may we never lose our wonder. He says, wide-eyed and mystified, may we be just like a child, staring at the beauty of our King." May we never lose our wonder. Lord, fill us with wonder. Oh. <laughs> it says, because you're beautiful in all your ways, right? And it's, that's really what it's about, staring at the beauty of our King, always looking at how good God is. And we see that through how he serves and how he blesses those that are around us. Amen? Amen. We have to look at the wonder of Jesus, and we can see that through the testimony of others. Now, this last one is, we'll look at the word of Jesus. Now, when I th talk about the word of Jesus, this is who he is, right? This is who Jesus is. There's no, like, if there's some things that Jesus wanted to show us, you know, how to pray and how to go up to the mountain and all the things that he showed us physically on the earth, the, 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 the miracles and everything else, they were all predicated on who he actually is, we know that he came to destroy the works of the devil, but John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word, you know, the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. If we skip down to verse 14, it goes on to say that that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So this word that they're talking about, you know, we think about the Trinity. We think about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Spirit, you know, who even in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, we know the Spirit moved upon the waters, but he had to say some words to allow these things to, 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 to happen. And so in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word was made flesh. And so now my question to you is, is that just Jesus? Or is, that, or is he really showing us how we're supposed to live our lives on the earth? The word becoming flesh. I didn't define this word inspiration, but if we look up, you know, Webster's dictionary uh, definition of the word inspiration, uh, it talks about um, the drawing of breath. You know, how we draw our breath. We're inspired. It's like breathing in, you know. And so when we take a deep breath, we're, in, we're inspiring or we're being inspired. Right. Um, if we look at uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, it talks something to the effect of uh, how the word of God is God inspired. It's God breathed. Right. This word is inspired by God. It's 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 good for um, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for correction and training in righteousness. So all scripture is God breathed. And that God breathed translates to inspiration. And so when we think about Jesus 
He is the word of God. Even the Webster's Dictionary, one of the, one of the comments or one of the, the points in the definition of the word, it talks about the divine uh, inspiration of the Bible. It was, it was even the way the Bible was, was written is defined in Webster, Webster's Dictionary. And I say all that to say that when we think about this word inspiration, it is very much tied to Jesus and him being the word, the word being God breathed, and we inhaling or taking in that word, making the word flesh. The very model that Jesus came to show us was, again, all these great miracles, all the you know, ways that he lived, but the core of who he was, he was the word of God who came to live life on the earth. And so now what does that mean for us? That means Byron is saying, I'm saying, I want you guys to begin to take the word of God and make the word flesh. Take the word of God and make the word flesh. How do I do that? And what's the result of me doing that? Well, let's take a look at a few scriptures. Joshua chapter 1, we'll look at verse 5 and read through about verse 8 or 9. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, we'll see how to do that. And once we do that, our lives begin to automatically change because it's now me living in this inspiration where the word is now driving me to do all the things that, that, that I focus on the word says do. Even though the word says to do so many different things in the limited time that I have on this earth, I can only focus potentially deeply on a small amount of it. But the word that I take and make part of me, whether it's through meditation and, and, and uh, scripture memory, all those kinds of things, that's the word that gets results in my life. That's the word that allows me to live on this earth and walk like Jesus. So Joshua chapter 1 verse 5, this is where uh, Moses died. And then after Moses dies, he um, uh, encounters God. He encounters God and then God begins to speak to him because now it's up to Joshua now to lead God's people into the promised land. So verse five, it says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So what are we reading here? We're reading God commissioning Joshua. He's, he's telling him what he's going to do. So there's promises. There's uh, an aspect of this is prophecy, meaning things that are to come. He's, he's giving him his encouragement, all those things. But the same thing that could happen to Joshua uh, could happen to John the Baptist, could happen to you and I. He says, as I was with Moses in verse five, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. For then you will be prosperous and then you will be successful, right? And so my success is not necessarily predicated upon my education or the things that I know. The Bible tells me that my success and my motivation for getting education, my motivation for reading a book and increasing my knowledge about certain things, whether it's my job or how to be a good father, how to be a good you know, spouse or whatever it is, is predicated on me getting and taking the word and meditating on it in such a way that it changes how I see my life. It says, keep this book always on your lips. Meditate on it day or night that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Another uh, example of this is in Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. Psalms 1 1 says, blessed is the person, the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. This person also should not stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Okay, so I want to be blessed, so I can't stand with the company of wicked. I can't sit in the seat of mockers. Um, I can't stand in the way that sinners take. Verse 2 says, but this person's delight is in the law of the Lord. And this law, you meditate, and, and who meditates on this law day and night. Well, what happens when we do so? Well, this person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever you do will prosper right? Whatever you do will prosper. I want to be prosperous. I really do. I want to be prosperous. Why is that? It's, it's, of course, not in the standpoint of I have to have, 
you know, all the money in the world. But prosperity means I'm in good health. But prosperity means I have a sound mind. Prosperity means I have, of course, as I do, a beautiful, brilliant wife, beautiful children, you know, that adore me, that worship the ground I walk on. Just kidding. Um, but, you know, I want people to look at me and say, man, he has spent some time with Jesus. You know, just like they looked at the disciples, again, no matter what my natural standing is, no matter how wealthy I am, no matter what kind of car I drive, people can look at you and say, man, he has spent time with Jesus. He's taken time, even as Ruthie said, as she came up, where we talked about the word being a seed. I've taken time to sow the seed of the word of God in my heart. And as I do so, not, but this is something that I have to actively do. This is one thing that's uh, doesn't just come naturally. It may not come just because. It may not come just by praying. This is something that where I have to now think about challenges that I'm having in my life. I identify a scripture to help me to overcome that challenge. I write that scripture down. I look at the scripture in the morning as I wake up and I do my quiet time. As I'm walking uh, throughout my day, I think about that scripture. As I, before I go, go to bed at night, I'm going to read that scripture again because the Bible says if I take and I delight in the law of the Lord, if I meditate in it day and night, if I observe to do everything that's written in the word that I can focus on and make part and parcel of me, then I will have good success and I will prosper. People will be able to look at you and say, yes, the word of God is in you. Amen. So the word of Jesus, this is exactly who he is and who he came to be. So when I say that Jesus is my inspiration, I am looking at the works. I'm looking at his ways. I'm looking at the wonder of how he moves in other people's lives. And I'm also saying I need to take who he is. Jesus is the word of God and make that part and parcel of me. Because why? Because he's so deserving. We talk about this idea of Jesus being our inspiration, he being our breath. You know, you think about every time we get to inhale, in him we move, we live, and we have our being. Every time I inhale, you know, this fresh oxygen that keeps me going, I can think about what Jesus did for me on the cross. How him being a sinless person without sin, he took upon himself my sin. He took upon himself my sicknesses, my diseases, my torments, and my pain. He took upon all the worst things that the devil and all his demons would want to place upon me. Jesus took them for me. He got up on the cross. He died as a perfect man, and he said, it is finished. In Mark chapter 15, 37, it says he, he breathed his last breath. Right. He gave up the ghost. He said, it is finished. He gave up. He exhaled, breathed that last breath so that I can inhale, so that I can take him in, so that I can take in his word. And it's a responsibility that I have. You know, it's not going to come naturally. God is, you know, people are not going to look at you and say, hey, man, you're so blessed just because you're born again. You know, it's gonna, they're going to say that because they can see the word of God working on the inside of you. The same person that you were yesterday, you're not going to be today and you're going to be a different person tomorrow because we make the word flesh. Because the word of God is so important to us that we always have it on our minds. We're always meditating. We're always thinking about the things that Jesus did, the wonder of how he's moving in his creation. And we can say that Jesus, you are my inspiration. So what's the application? It's just that. You know, one example um, is this scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians, or this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, we all know that this is a love, the love passage. It talks about love, that love endures long. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not envious. It doesn't boil over with jealousy. All the things that love does, you know, and the expression of love is because God is love. Uh, as we were talking through this in our, in our um, microchurch, you know, going through this, somebody gave us this poem, Liana, actually. She, gave, she shared this poem. And... Um, so this, as we were talking about, you know, this word and how the word changes our mind and changes our hearts, she said, this is a great example of what you're talking about. So I'm going to read this poem that's really an adaptation of 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, it says, love is an action. It says, I am patient with you because I love you and want to forgive you. I am kind to you because I love you and want to help you. I do not boast about my attainments because I love you and want to hear about yours. I am not proud because I love you and want to esteem you before myself. I am not rude because I love you and care about your feelings. I am not self-seeking because I love you and want to meet your needs. I am not easily angered by you because I love you and want to overlook your offenses. I do not keep a record of your wrongs because I love you and love covers a multitude of sins, right? So the definition of love are all those things, being patient, being kind, 
But when that love impacts us, we can say, yes, I do not take offense at you because I love you. Because the word says to love, and I'm going to take that, make that part and parcel of who I am. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to read. I'm going to, you know, uh, focus on this word so that now I cannot be self-seeking because I love you and I want to meet your needs. I won't be easily angered by you because I love you and I want to overlook your offenses. I want the love of God to change my outlook on life and how I treat people. Amen. And so, again, my only application is that you go out and do the same thing. As we are, you know, in this time where we're celebrating Jesus, we're celebrating this Christmas story. Uh, We read Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. This might be a good start for you. Just thinking about how big and how awesome God is. So that no matter what problem, no matter what issue I have in my life, if I can Uh, receive this Savior, this Savior Jesus, this wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, knowing that the increase of of God's government and peace, it will be no end because of Jesus. And I am in this government that there's nothing I cannot do, nothing that God won't do through me. Amen. Amen.